thank you. We will have one more gardening webinar after this. We're really excited to bring these to you uh, with Contra Costa County Library and the Contra Costa UC Master Gardeners. I'm going to turn things over to our wonderful Master Gardener, Andrea Salzman, and she will get you started with our webinar. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Allison. Thank you again to the library for co-hosting this event with us. We really appreciate it and welcome everybody. We are going to be spending the next about hour and 15 minutes with you talking about what went wrong in your summer garden. And I'm going to go ahead and launch a poll really quick. Um, we're going to try to do some polls throughout tonight's talk uh, just to engage our audience. We wish we could be there in person, but this is our way to get to know some of you. So while you take a look at this question, we're wondering how many of you have previously attended one of our talks. We're curious how many um, of you are visiting us for the first time and how many of us uh, we're welcoming back again. So if you could just take a few minutes, I'm going to go over, it looks like so far um, most folks are new. So while you guys finish filling out that poll, I'm going to go over what our mission is. So our Master Gardener program is affiliated with the University of California, and we are all trained volunteers. And um, what we do is we use our training through the University of California to provide programs to Contra Costa County residents um, on information such as home horticulture, pest management, sustainable landscape practices, and more. So today's session is one of those type things. We'll be providing you information on vegetable gardening. So I'm gonna end our poll and share the results. Well, I'm thrilled. It's almost half of you, this is your first time. So welcome. Uh, we're really glad to have you. Um, hopefully that gave you a little bit of background of who we are and we hope everyone enjoys the um, presentation tonight. We're curious, so a lot of you are new to us. We're curious where in the county you're coming from. Um, and maybe you're outside of the county. So tell us a little bit about where you are. Do you live in West County, El Cerrito, Richmond, San Pablo, Hercules, Central, Contra Costa County, like Martinez, Walnut Creek, Pleasant Hill, La Mirinda area? Are you in the East County, Pittsburgh, Bay Point, Antioch, Brentwood, um, another county in the Bay Area? Maybe you're outside of the Bay Area or outside of California. I'll share the results. So we've got a good 70% of you are from our central Contra Costa County, um, about 14% from the west, uh, four from the east, and we have 11 people from outside of Contra Costa but are in the Bay Area, and we have a few who are outside of the Bay Area in California. So again, welcome all. Um, I'm gonna get quick to the next part of introducing our wonderful speaker. She's gonna be spending the next hour talking to you about common vegetable growing problems and how to correct them. She'll, she's going to teach you, Monica Witte will teach you how to identify problems in your garden and some suggestions on how to fix them. Might be too late for this year, but next year you're going to be really well prepared. And you're going to really enjoy listening to Monica. She's been a master gardener with our program since 2017. Um, uh, prior to that, she was a retired engineer with Lawrence Livermore Laboratories. She's a very avid volunteer in our program, volunteering at our, our garden, our demonstration garden in Walnut Creek. She works at our help desk answering questions to the public, and she's currently our project lead for our Growing Gardeners program. Um, and also in her spare time, she finds time to volunteer teaching math at a local middle school. So I'm going to, without further ado, welcome Monica and get everybody um, started um, on this project. So we'll get going here. I hope that you were able to see Marion Woodard's wonderful talk on vegetable gardening a few weeks ago. She emphasized practices related to these four general categories. Think about these four things when you're reviewing what happened in your garden this past summer. We refer to these practices as good general care. The first is soil. Soil is the basis for a healthy garden. It's home to an entire system of living things, fungi, bacteria, earthworms, plant roots, keep it healthy. The second is water. Consistent moisture in the soil is key, and you're gonna hear me say that over and over again this evening. We all know that too much or too little water can be dangerous for plants. Aeration, number three is aeration. Many people underappreciate the importance of the air in our soil. And yet, without the pore spaces in the soil, which, will, which allow the plants to obtain oxygen and the living things that live in the soil to breathe, the plants will not survive. Take care of these pore spaces. 
And last but not least, energy from the sun is a driver for plant growth. Just as for water, too much or too little sunshine can create problems. Three of those four categories can also be contributors to likely problems for plants. Soil, water, and sun. I'll talk about all six. If the soil ecosystem is out of balance or if the soil is compacted, plants won't thrive. The next two, water and sunlight, contribute to the most common plant problems. Nutrition, adequate nutrition is critical and there can be too much, such as an excess of fertilizer or too little. And pests and diseases, I'll talk about specific examples for most of this presentation. But first, let's go through some basic ideas to help our vegetable plants be sturdy enough to withstand any problems that come their way. Each vegetable growing season, improve your soil with compost. Nurture the ecosystem in the soil. But wait, you might say, some of the organisms in the soil are harmful to my plants. And yes, that's true. But of all the organisms in soils, only a small number of bacteria, fungi, insects, and nematodes might harm plants. They all compete for resources, air, water, nutrition, and space. If the soil food web is healthy, the competition results in pathogens being held in check. Use plant diversity to increase soil diversity. Protect the soil from compaction. Disturb the soil as little as possible. And don't walk on it or work on it, work with it when wet, especially don't do that. You will often hear or read that good cultural care for your plant includes, here's that phrase again, consistently moist soil. How can you tell? Feel it with your, feel the soil with your hands. Here, I've got a, oh, I have to turn on my little pointer. There we go, maybe. No, it didn't work. Yeah, what was the laser pointer? There we go. Feel the soil with your hands and measure with a moisture meter and use a soil probe if you have one. This gadget, this T-shaped gadget is about two feet long and you can press it into the soil and get a sample of, of soil at the roots, right around the roots of your plants. So you can figure out whether or not the moisture is getting where it wants to really want it and how moist it is. The soil in the root zone should be moist to about six or eight inches. This should be at the, the case at planting time. You shouldn't plant into a dry bed. The soil in your bed should be moist before you start. And again, after each watering. Irrigate when the top couple of inches have dried out and avoid alternating wet and dry conditions. I mentioned earlier that the most common issues are related to water and sunlight. Most vegetables need at least eight hours of direct sunlight. Plants that we grow for their fruit, including tomatoes and zucchini and cucumbers need at least eight and do better with 10 hours of sunlight. Plants that we grow for their roots or their flowers, so carrots, beets, or radishes, or cauliflower and broccoli require less, four to six hours. Plants that we grow for their leaves, including leafy greens such as lettuce, kale, chard, and spinach, have the lowest requirements for sun and can be grown with as little as three hours of sun. But remember, even these plants may prefer more sun and they will have thinner leaves and be less robust than if they were grown with more sun. But there's always an exception. Lettuce does well with less sun and no vegetable does well in shade. When the air temperatures are high, as they are right now, and they have been for the last week and will be again for the next week, that temperature can be a limiting factor. So consider providing some shade as an escape from the heat. Most of this presentation will be about dealing with specific pests and diseases. As master gardeners, we support methods you can use to solve pest problems while minimizing risks. And we call this Integrated Pest Management, or IPM. I have a personal example. About 15 years ago, a friend told me that soldier beetles in her backyard took care of all the aphids on her roses. I didn't believe it, although this friend is an, a wonderful gardener. I tried it the following year, and sure enough, 
The aphids arrived with the new spring growth, and a week or two later, soldier beetles appeared. Each successive year, the soldier beetles arrived in greater numbers. They've definitely found a home in my backyard. The first thing you need to do if you have, if you have a pest that you're trying to deal with is practice prevention. Prevent the pests from invading or building up their populations in the first place. This might include moving their sources of food, for example. Cultural practices are things you can do to discourage that invasion, such as removing debris, proper watering, and using plant varieties which are resistant to that pest or disease. Physical controls might include squirting water to blow those pests off or putting up some barriers or traps. Biological controls could be the use of beneficial organisms. This means encouraging natural enemies, lady beetles and soldier beetles, for example. A very important aspect of this is to avoid the use of broad spectrum pesticides. Related to my soldier beetle example, I learned that soldier beetles overwinter as pupa in the soil so that they are ready to go to battle in the spring when I need them, as long as I do not disturb the soil or spray pesticides. And only if non-chemical methods are not available, consider the use of pesticides as a last resort. Continuing the theme of good practices, those that I've listed here are, relate to bacterial and fungal diseases. Avoid getting water on the leaves whenever possible. Remove infected leaves throughout the season and remove all debris at the end of each season. Next year, plant disease resistant varieties. I'll have a link at the end of this talk to a wonderful resource from Cornell University, which lists disease resistant varieties for counties across the United States. This information will also be in the handout that you will receive. Plant new seedlings far enough apart so that there's adequate air around each plant. And rotate crops to discourage soil-borne insect and disease pests, and also to help prevent depletion of soil nutrients. The period of rotation for crop rotation can be two years for foliar diseases, and four to six or more years for many soil-borne diseases. They live a long time in the soil. So this rotation is hard to do unless you have a great deal of space. So do the best you can and plant resistant varieties. The next thing I'm going to do is go through a pretty long list of issues that people in our county may encounter. Before I do this, let's briefly review what we learned so far. Take care of your soil. Learn how to evaluate the moisture in your soil. Sun is important. Enough is good, too much is not good. And do not overuse pesticides. Protect the bees, protect the soil. And also, make it a habit to observe your plants and learn to recognize what healthy plants look like. At this point, I'd like to ask you to keep track of how many of the issues that we'll talk about you've seen in your own garden. Is it more than five, more than 10? I probably had seven or eight of them myself this summer. I will cover some issues for some but not all of these plants in the Solanaceae plant family. I have organized these issues by plant family because in many cases, members of the same family will share susceptibility to the issues. So remember, the Solanaceae family is sometimes called the nightshade family, and it includes tomatoes, peppers, potatoes, eggplants, and tomatillos. So now Andrea would like to launch another poll. Yes, yeah, so our next poll, um, talking about the nightshade family, we're curious, how many of you have grown tomatoes in your home garden. Go ahead and take a few minutes. Monica is going to be talking a lot about tomatoes, so we're hoping that uh, this is something that's relevant to many of you. And by the responses that I see so far, I think the answer is going to be yes. <laughs> okay, I am going to pub share the results. So yeah, 98% of you, over 200 of you have grown tomatoes. And for those who haven't, you know, you'll get some tips for when you do. So that's great. So the first thing I want to talk about is the blossoms that might fall off. And this can happen for several possible reasons. One that uh, could have been earlier in the season, night temperatures fall below 55 degrees. Cool nighttime temperatures can interfere with pollen formation and fruit ripening. 
So in this case, choose quick maturing varieties, such as early girl. Another possible problem with blossoms is that the daytime temperatures are too warm. If it's consistently above 90 degrees, again, you're going to tolerant varieties if this is the case in your, in your garden. Another possible issue is just that there's not enough light, too much shade. So choose early maturing tomato varieties for, for spring growing in cooler climates and choose a heat tolerant variety for areas with long periods of hot or humid weather. This next problem that I want to talk about is, I have to move this off of my screen, um, is blossom end rot. Um, Andrea, do you see the poll on, my, on the screen that I'm sharing? Is that visible to you? Um, I do not see it. Perfect. I just clicked it close. Um, okay, so I'm glad that, to know that. So uh, blossom end rot occurs on the blossom end of tomatoes. And if you look at this example right here, this tomato is connected to the plant by the stem end. So this is the stem end and the opposite end over here is the blossom end. It's the end where the blossom originally was. So blossom end rot is a disorder that creates a dark sunken area on this end, on the blossom end of tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, and zucchini. Fast growing varieties with extensive foliage are frequently affected. And this is particularly common on paste tomatoes, and these over here are San Marzano's. Secondary pathogens can affect this blossom end rot area, causing overall fruit rot. And you will hear people say that blossom end rot is caused by calcium and water imbalance. But adding calcium to the soil often doesn't alleviate the problem because calcium is available in most California soils. It may not be available to the tomato because of inconsistent moisture in the soil. There's that phrase again. In terms of management, blossom end rot is primarily a water issue. And fruits in the rapid expansion phase, so that's fruits that are one third to one half size of full size, are very susceptible to water stress. And even a temporary water stress in this period can induce blossom end rot. And now we will talk about four fungal diseases and two bacterial diseases, and all six result in discolored leaves. Here are two fungal diseases that can affect tomatoes and other vegetables as well, and both are called vascular wilt diseases, and they're difficult to distinguish from one another. Symptoms include yellowing and browning of foliage. When an infective st infected stem is split open lengthwise, you will see browning of the vascular tissue as you do here. Oops. Even though the center of the stem remains green. Verticillium wilt can affect all Solanaceae, some coal crops, cucurbits, artichokes, and lettuces. And Fusarium can also affect asparagus, cabbage, and melons. Both of these are soil-borne funguses, and they can fungi, and they can persist in soil for many years. They do not spread from plant to plant above ground. Each plant is individually infected when the organism enters the root system. There is no cure for these disease. There is no chemical that you can spray on the plant for a cure. You need to use resistant cultivars. A long crop rotation of four to six years might help to reduce the fungal levels in the soil, but it won't completely cure these diseases. And so, as I said, the most practical means of controlling these two wilts is the use of resistant varieties. So there are codes for, desistant, for disease resistance when plants have been hybridized for that resistance. And here's what that looks like on a label. So this is an example label of a cherry tomato. It's called small fry, and it has these letters after the name VFN. And these are the codes for three resistances, Verticillium wilt resistance, Fusarium wilt resistance, and nematode resistance. So the codes, there are a variety of codes that growers um, and hybridizers have created, and there are many, but there are some common ones that I'll provide you at the end of this talk. But they're for hybrids. It's also true that some heirlooms or open pollinated plants can be resistant to some fungal and bacterial diseases, 
And you can identify these and find out which ones they are at the Cornell University website that I mentioned earlier. Two more fungal diseases include septoria leaf spot and early blight. These are, there are usually numerous spots on each leaf for both of these. In the case of early blight, a telltale sign are these concentric circles on the spots. Both of these are managed in the same manner. In both cases, the disease can be spread by overhead watering. So avoid getting water on the leaves whenever possible and do not work on the plant when the leaves are wet so that you avoid spreading the disease yourself. Pick off infected leaves. Picking off those infected leaves might slow the progression of fungal diseases. Clearing away all dead or infected plant material at the end of each season is a good idea always. And if you're planting in containers, clean the container well before you plant and use potting soil that has not been used in the prior year to grow tomatoes or other solanaceae plants. There are tomatoes that are resistant to early blight and I believe the code is EB, but there are none as far as I know that have been bred for resistance to septoria. Something to keep in mind is that the spores can also survive in the soil or in a compost pile for at least one year. And unless the pile is managed in a way that allows the compost to develop very heat, hot temperatures for a sustained period of time, compost with debris from infected plants could transmit the disease back into the garden. So be careful about that when you're um, tossing out your debris for the year. Second spot are two bacterial diseases with similar symptoms to one another, and they cause small black specks or patches on the leaves, stems, and fruit. For these two bacterial diseases, they can be spread plant to plant via splashing water like early blight and septoria leaf spot. So avoid overhead watering. Since these overwinter in soil and on debris from the previous season, clean debris and practice crop rotation. Also, the spot bacterium is seed borne and can occur within the seed and on the seed surface. So for this reason, tomato volunteers from this plant can be hosts. So you're gonna wanna uh, not allow any volunteers in the area that have had diseased tomatoes to grow, toss them out. So you might be wondering whether the fruit from uh, diseased looking potato, uh, tomatoes, excuse me, is edible. So the University of Wisconsin recommends not eating symptomatic fruit of speck and spot infected tomatoes. And what about unblemished tomatoes growing on plants with leaves, stems, or adjacent fruit showing signs of infection? They can be safely eaten. Plants that are overexposed to direct sunlight can develop sun scald. Fruits can turn light brown, as you see here. In fact, in my garden, they've been even much lighter brown, almost white on this side. The fruit can turn leathery on the side that's exposed to the sun and the leaves may appear scorched. The solution here is to maintain a leaf cover. Be cautious about how you prune. The fungal and bacterial leaves, the diseases that we just talked about, can also lead to defoliation of the yellow spotted leaves. So a second hit for those plants is that they may now get sun scald due to a lack of leaf cover. This guy is a tomato hornworm. Tomato hornworm larvae can only infest plants from the Solanaceae family. The hornworms can get very large. They can get up to four inches long. And they are the caterpillar of a large moth that can have a wingspan of five inches. It's pretty amazing. Tomato hornworms are likely to be the largest caterpillars you'll see in the garden. And they may leave large black or green droppings on the ground or on the leaves beneath the tomato plants to give you a hint that they're in the area. The hornworms feed on blossoms, leaves, and fruit. This is pretty amazing, isn't it? This is the damage on the fruit from a caterpillar, from a hornworm. Looks like a, a rat got to it or a squirrel. The leaves would be eaten, the stems remain. Fruit with small to large gouges, uh, large gouges at, um, is what, that's what you'll end up with. And most damage from the hornworm occurs during the middle and end of the summer, so right about now. Our newspaper columnist Joan Morris says, the surest way to find them is with a black light in the dead of night. The hornworms will fluoresce under the light. The solution here is to hand pick them. And also birds will, will normally keep populations under control because they're a pretty tasty morsel. 
At the end of summer, many of us have green tomatoes which do not ripen. And here are a couple of possible causes. Tomatoes need plenty of leaf surface for photosynthesis in order to ripen. And often by late summer, some of the leaves on the tomatoes have started to dry up and wither. That's already happening in my garden now. And they're no longer helping to nourish the plant. The plant is simply less vigorous than it was earlier in the season. And so it takes longer for the green tomatoes to ripen. High temperatures are also a major cause of slow ripening. When the air temperature rises above 85 degrees, ripening slows. The soil temperature can also be important. For optimal growth, tomatoes need soil temperatures that are less than 80 degrees. Hot air temperatures raise the soil temperature. Containers can be particularly vulnerable to soil temperatures uh, if they sit in the hot afternoon sun. So mulching can help from the surface, but honestly, if you have tomatoes in containers and they're hit in the, in the hot sunshine, you might want to erect some kind of shade for that container to keep the sun off. You can speed up ripening by removing some of the green tomatoes, and then the tomato plant can put all its energy into ripening the tomatoes that remain on the plant. Don't be tempted to fertilize the tomato plant, thinking it will speed up production. Fertilizing now will probably just cause the tomato to go into a growth mode too late to be useful. Next, we'll take a look at several concerns related to the skin of the tomato cracking or being malformed. In this first case, the skin on cherry tomatoes frequently splits when the fruit is close to ripe and it suddenly swells due to taking in too much water. The solution to this is somewhat obvious, eat the tomatoes when they're ripe and don't leave them on the vine, and maintain consistent soil moisture. And here are two more skin cracking or malformation issues on tomatoes. Fast fruit growth can cause growth cracks. This may be caused by excess, not, uh, excess irrigation along with high temperatures, or it can happen when you water after a dry spell. The cracks can radiate out from the stem end, or they can be circumferential around the tomato. The cracks can be invaded by secondary fungi and bacteria that further rot the fruit. Cat facing is a malformation and cracking on the other end, on the blossom end. In cat facing, the female part of the flower develops abnormally due to low temperatures during flowering. And cat facing is also affected by inconsistent soil moisture. For both cracking and cat facing, there are resistant varieties and that will make a big difference. Also maintaining moist, consistent soil moisture is important for both. Here's a picture of a potato leaf, which you'll remember is also in the Solanaceae family. Spider mites are common pests of vegetables and other plants and cause leaf stippling or spotting. The mites are tiny and hard to see. These are under a magnifying lens. They look like tiny moving dots. Although related to insects, mites are arachnids. If leaves are stippled with white dots or have webbing, like you see here, check the undersides to see if spider mites are present. Because these guys have so many natural enemies, including lacewings, predatory mites, and others, spider mites frequently become a problem only after insecticides have been applied, killing off the populations of good bugs. Drought stress contributes to sensitivity of plants to spider mites. So irrigate sufficiently and keep the dust down since the mites thrive in dusty environments, both for the dust and to directly wash off the mites, spray with water to the undersides of the leaves as often as you can or twice a day. Next, we'd like to take some questions. We have two people with us this evening who both volunteer at the Master Gardener Help Desk, Sarah Hoyer, became a master gardener in 2010 and has been answering garden questions on the help desk for the past 20 years. She planted her first small vegetable garden more than 40 years ago. And today she gardens on several acres with a half acre planted in a wide variety of vegetable crops, berries, and fruit trees. Terry Lippert has grown vegetables and fruits year round in the Bay Area for over 25 years and regularly presents programs for our Master Gardener Speakers Bureau about growing edibles. She tries to spend at least one day each week answering garden questions submitted to the help desk. 
And Andrea has been collecting your questions in the chat space, so I'll hand this over to her. Great, thank you, Monica. So we have some, we're gonna focus on questions at this point um, on the family, Solonese family that we went through um, earlier. And some of the other questions that came in, we'll save those to the end after we go through the plant families um, that your questions are in. So we've got a number of questions about tomatoes. And I will throw the first question um, out to um, Sarah. Um, the question was about crop rotation. Should my tomatoes be planted in a different area each year, every other year, or how often should I uh, rotate where I plant my tomatoes? Is Sarah with us? Sorry, folks, she's here. Let me just unmute her so she can chat one second. Thank you. Okay, am I unmuted? You are on. We could hear you, Sarah. Welcome. Okay, thanks for that question. It's a good one. Um, I believe Monica mentioned earlier that it's best if your tomatoes do show signs of disease to at least rotate for two years. With the soil borne diseases, it's better to do a lot more than that six years and even more the these diseases will live in the soil a long time so it's not an easy answer i know i've i've planted tomatoes in the same place for years and i have started to get diseases now so i will be um doing a lot more rotating if you don't have room then you can try planting them in large containers. Well, they do have to be quite big, at least 18 inches or more. So I hope that answered your question. Great, thank you, Sarah. I'm gonna throw the next one at Terry, and we've got a couple questions about um, uh, blossom and rot. And the first couple, two questions. One is, can peppers get and rot? And the second, and really also, um, refresh them. Question was, they uh, wanted clarification. Is it too much or too little water or both that causes blossom and rot? Okay, well, yes, the answer on the pepper is yes, it can get blossom and rot. Uh, really, all of the fruits uh, that grow in this uh, nightshade family, so uh, that would include not only uh, peppers, but eggplant, for example, they can all have blossom and rot. And the problem is not so much too much or too little, it's more inconsistency. So your plant may be getting enough water uh, to be able to grow and produce the fruits, uh, but if it's drying out in the root area, you know, in, on a hot day, and then the next morning it gets water again, uh, it's growing, but the inconsistency in the moisture level is what's causing the problem. So good things to do, I like to use a moisture uh, meter that you can buy at uh, a big box store or at a nursery. They allow you to go down six to eight inches into the root zone and know what your moisture level is. Uh, if you find it's uh, drying out in the heat of the day, you might have to alter your practices a little bit in how you water. Also mulching uh, over the uh, surface of the soil is going to help reduce evaporation and uh, allow you to keep the moisture levels more even. Great, thank you. Okay, I think we have time for one question. I'm just trying to, there's quite a few coming through. Uh, tomatoes, something is eating my tomatoes at night. Monica, I'll give you this one. Uh, what could it be? What are possible culprits for eating these delicious, you know, lovingly grown tomatoes? Well, it could be all sorts of things. If the uh, if the uh, teeth marks are large, then I would suspect squirrels or rats or maybe a hornworm. Um, if the, if the, there's a great deal of damage, if there's a little tiny bit of damage, uh, then it could be something else that you could have damage from a smaller insect, I think. I don't know, I'm not sure about the smaller insects eating the tomato fruit. Um, so I guess if it's a large uh, chew, I would suspect a larger animal especially if it's happening at night, yeah. 
Great, thank you. Um, I'm writing down all of our questions and I'm gonna save the rest for the end and let Monica get back to the rest of the presentation. Great. So um, next we're gonna go on, to, we're gonna launch into the cucurbit family. So we're gonna talk about some issues for some of the plants that are including squash, cucumbers, pumpkins, and melons. So the first one we're gonna look at, uh, my young zucchini shrivel and drop. And I wanna um, find my pointer here. Zucchini and other squashes and melons have both male and female flowers. Gardeners often become concerned when many flowers appear early, but fruits fail to set. And the reason for this is that for most varieties, the early flowers are males. Female flowers develop somewhat later and can be identified by the miniature fruit at the flower base. So you can take a look here. Here's the blossom. And at the base of the blossom is a small fruit. This small fruit is there even before the fruit, even before the flower is pollinated. So, and on a male flower, a male blossom, the stem just comes right up into the blossom. There is no miniature fruit. So once you know this, it's very easy to identify male and female blossoms. The pollen is for a squash plant um, and all cucurbits is sticky and heavy. And therefore wind blown pollination does not happen. So you need a pollinator to set fruit. When the bees are absent, fruit set in the cucurbit family is non-existent. So what you can do instead, if there are no bees present, you can hand pollinate the female squash flowers. Use a small artist's paintbrush or a Q-tip to transfer pollen from the male anther to the female stigma. And do this only on the first day that the female flowers are open since they're viable for one day only. And please remember, don't use insecticides that kill bees. What about powdery mildew? My squash leaves are covered with white powder and this is happening now in many of our gardens. It happens later in the summer. Several different fungi can cause this. The symptoms may vary slightly, but they generally include this powdery growth followed by yellowing and dying leaves. The plants may die. This affects zucchini, and all summer squash, and also winter squash, melons, and cucumbers. It doesn't affect the quality of the vegetables, except for peas. Powdery mildew's preferred climate, hot dry days, cool nights, and morning fog can be found in some parts of our county, West County, I think. Um, there are some strategies for dealing with powdery mildew, and that includes planting resistant varieties, plant in full sun, Maintain good air circulation, so don't plant them too close together. And surprisingly, wash the powder off in the mornings. I don't know, remember I said at the beginning of the talk to keep uh, overhead irrigation to a minimum. The one exception to that is this. It's, you can wash off the powdery mildew. If you do it in the morning, the leaves will be dry by nightfall and you can reduce the level of um, powdery mildew on the leaves. Also, remove affected uh, parts, leaves and other parts. What about slugs and snails? Slugs and snails are among the most destructive pests found in the garden. They create irregular holes with smooth edges on leaves and flowers. And I only recently learned snails feed on the surface of the fruit and slugs hollow the fruit out. Snail and slug damage can be confused with feeding by other pests such as earwigs, caterpillars, or other chewing insects. Look for silvery mucus trails to confirm that slugs or snails cause the damage rather than other pests. Best management relies on a combination of methods. Eliminate their hiding places such as debris or boards. Snail bait can be a part of the management system. Using drip irrigation will reduce the humidity and reduce the numbers of moist services. And also hand picking can be effective if you do it on a regular basis. You can also create some traps and uh, trap the snails and slugs beneath boards or flower pots that you position throughout the garden. Inverted melon rinds can make a good trap. And as I said, leaf damage can also be caused by chewing insects. The ragged holes that are eaten in otherwise green and healthy leaves could be from either cucumber beetles or earwigs. 
These pests will leave behind similar appearing damage, but they have very different habits from one another. Earwigs feed at night and hide in cool, dark places during the heat of the day. Earwigs are third only to snails and slugs in causing plant damage. And while they can be beneficial because they eat insects such as aphids, they also feed on soft plants. Earwigs can do quite a lot of damage if there's a high population. Look for earwigs at night with a flashlight. Or roll up a sheet of newspaper and rest it on the vegetable bed at night. Check it in the morning. Some solutions for earwigs, clean up any debris and then consider using a trap. A trap that many master gardeners use is a simple tuna can or a small cottage cheese container. Partially fill it with vegetable oil and a few drops of fish oil. Set this on the bed where the earwigs live. Cucumber beetles, on the other hand, travel in the daytime and can damage cucumbers, squashes, melons, and pumpkins. Those are their favorites, but they may also be found on tomatoes and other garden crops if cucurbits are unavailable. The adults can also spread other diseases, viruses and the bacterial wilt I was talking about earlier, which is perhaps the more damaging aspect of what they do in our gardens. The wilt bacteria are then spread to the plant by the beetle chewing on it. And if it's not contained by pruning off infected stems, the wilt will eventually spread and kill the entire plant. And also, plants infected with bacterial wilt will attract more cucumber beetles, which will eat the infected leaves and continue spreading the bacteria throughout the garden. So what do you do? Management of cucumber beetles is tricky. Most older plants, however, can support substantial numbers without serious damage. You can protect young cucurbit seedlings by covering them right after planting with a protective cloth and removing it when plants are old enough to tolerate some damage. It may also be a good idea to plant the cucurbits later in the season after the beetles may have been attracted to those planted elsewhere. Next, I'm gonna cover a couple of issues for peas and beans. We'll look at three possibilities for what happened when your bean seedlings disappeared. This happened to me this year more than once. Bean seeds and seedlings are attractive to birds. To protect from the birds, cover the newly planted seeds or seedlings with a row cover until they're established. Cutworms are another problem. Cutworms are dull brown caterpillars normally found on or just below the soil surface or on lower parts of the plants, and they're usually active at night. They are well camouflaged and can be hard to spot. They clip off the seedling stems near the soil level. You'll walk out one morning and the plants are just clipped off two inches above ground or an inch above the, the surface. They are pests mainly in the spring. So if you keep the garden free of debris and plant more than you need, because there are so many of these around, hand picking at night with a flashlight can also work. In vegetable gardens, you can protect with cardboard collars, like a cut in half toilet paper roll, a screen or protective cloth. Cutworms are difficult to control with insecticides. Another problem for seedlings is damping off which is the name given to a collection of seedling diseases that are usually caused by fungi. These issues include seeds that fail to emerge or die soon after they emerge. And these fungi are present in virtually all soils. Growing slowly in cold, wet soil is a contributing factor. And to avoid this, you'll need good drainage and be sure that organic matter such as compost is fully decomposed. The trick here is to give your seedlings a fighting chance. Plant when the temperatures are favorable for rapid seedling growth and don't overwater. So what about beans that aren't producing pods? There are a number of possibilities. It could be due to pollination problems, which might be a result of nighttime temperatures that are either too cold, below 55 degrees, or more likely these days too high, above 64 degrees. Warm nights aren't good either. And daytime temperatures are too, if they're too high, greater than 90 degrees, then pollination may not occur. Pole and bush varieties and lima beans, as well as peas, are usually self-fertile. They need neither a pollinator nor a pollinizer. And you might remember a pollinator is the bee, for example, that moves the pollen, and a pollinizer is the plant that provides the pollen. 
Runner beans are also self-fertile, but they need to be shaken by an insect or by you, the gardener, in order for pollination to occur. Inconsistent moisture can also cause the bean pods to drop. So there's that phrase again. And also time can be a factor. Whole beans may simply take longer to mature than bush beans, so be patient. So we talked earlier about powdery mildew on cucurbits, and uh, it can also be a problem for peas. And in the case of peas, it will also affect a can and these affected pods are inedible. Remember I said the zucchini you could eat if they were on a plant with powdery mildew, but not the pods. So next, I want to just touch on one problem in the umbellifer family. I just like that name, umbellifer. That includes carrots, celery, fennel, parsnip, dill, and, and uh, parsnips. My carrots don't grow straight. Twisted roots can signal overcrowding. And bent roots usually mean that the heavy clay soil, rocks, or other obstructions got in the way. Hairiness means the soil was waterlogged or over fertilized. And too much fertilizer can also lead to multiple roots. Also disturbing the roots, such as by transplanting seedlings, can result in forked roots. Also, if you've accidentally left the carrots in for a year, they may put out another root from the original tap root. And at this point, the carrots won't be tasty in any case because the nutrients in the root will go into the flower and seed production. So the solution here, if possible, is to plant carrots in loose, consistently moist, but not soggy soil, and thin the plants to prevent overcrowding. Unfortunately, there's also a soil-borne pest that can cause some of the same issues. Microscopic, worm-like, root-knot nematodes can deform carrots in similar ways, and their management is difficult. Planting resistant varieties, remember that N on the label, and practicing Crop rotation can help. And next I want to, I have one example of an allium that we're going to touch on. This is the family that includes onions, garlic, chives, and leeks. Just about every plant has one or more aphid species that feeds on it. Aphids are common in vegetable gardens because they like lush new growth. You can squirt the pests with a spray of water and prune out whatever doesn't fall off with the water spray. And if you'd like something stronger, make a weak solution of water and dish soap to spray on the leaves. The photo in the center here was taken in my garden a few days ago. What I will do is clip it nearly to the ground, spray the plant with a strong stream of water, and then spray again with a quart of water mixed with one tablespoon of dish soap. Lots of nitrogen increases the presence of aphids because nitrogen produces the lush growth that aphids enjoy. Ants are often associated with aphid populations and frequently are a clue that an aphid infestation is present. If you see large numbers of aphids, excuse me, of ants, check for aphids or other honeydew producing insects in your garden. Ants protect aphids and so managing ants is, key, is a key component of aphid management. Both lady beetles and their larvae are voracious aphid eaters. And if some of you have not seen the larvae, this is what they look like. They're pretty cool. Um, they a bit like tiny, colorful alligators. And if you see these in your garden, be thankful. And next I wanna talk about one problem that affects uh, plants in the amaranth family. This includes uh, chard, uh, Swiss chard, spinach, and beets. Leaf miners are a common problem for these plants. Um, what you'll see uh, is a meandering trail on the leaf. This will give you an indication that leaf miners are present. The leaf miner is sitting between the two, the inside of the upper and lower surface of the leaves and creating a channel. And so they're protected from any insecticide you might stray. So in fact, insecticides are not usually effective. The leaf miners are often controlled by other natural predators and they rarely require treatment. On the chard, you can simply remove and dispose of the older and damaged leaves. This is what the fly looks, an adult fly looks like. 
And he's laying, he can lay eggs on the surface of the leaves. If you are very ambitious, you can handpick the eggs to keep them from developing. Next, I'm gonna talk about sweet potatoes. Those of you who know me know that this is one of my favorite vegetables to both grow and cook. A problem that I had this year, early in the season, my sweet potato leaves were eaten to the ground. What many people do not know is that all parts of the sweet potato are edible. The leaves can be sauteed like kale and spinach, and they're delicious. And squirrels have figured this out. So in my garden, they took this, the plant down to the ground level. And so what I did was I erected some cages so that the plants would recover. This was probably two months ago. They're quite a bit larger now. The plant will recover even if all the leaves are eaten. White flies are another problem for sweet potatoes and many other vegetables. They're tiny sap sucking insects that feed on many vegetables, especially in warm weather. They are not true flies, but are related to aphids. The white flies will quickly flutter up and fly away when you disturb them. You may have seen a poof when you disturb a plant. Like aphids, white flies excrete a sugary liquid called honeydew. So the leaves may be sticky or covered with black sooty mold that grows on the honeydew. The honeydew attracts ants, which interfere with the activities of natural enemies, of, as we talked about before, and they, those would control the white flies and other pests. So you have to manage the ants. The white flies can injure the plants by sucking juices from them, causing leaves to yellow, shrivel, and drop prematurely. White fly adults can transmit several viruses from diseased to healthy plants through their mouth parts. So keep the dust down, remove the debris and any other infested crops, and prune away severely infested portions of the plant. You can also try vacuuming white flies in the early morning when they are cold and slow moving. This removes the adults before they have a chance to lay more eggs. And after vacuuming, empty the bag in a sealed plastic bag or someplace secure so that they don't become a problem, continue to be a problem in your garden. Natural enemies can keep these in check, such as lacewings. So if you see those, do not spray with insecticides. And now we have another poll, Andrea. Sure, let me launch that for you, Monica. So I've come to the long list, the end of my long collection of problems, and I appreciate that you're stuck with me. And here our question is, how many of the common gardening problems have you experienced in your own garden? I've seen I've a few. Seen <laughs> I've seen many. Looks like almost nobody has zero. Looks like one person has none. That's a pretty lucky gardener. And a good gardener. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll and share the results. So it looks like a majority of you, 49%, have seen three to four of these problems in your home garden followed next by one to two problems with 27%, and then uh, almost a quarter, 24% of you have seen five or more problems. So I think we, we all can relate to each other here. <laughs> We're all in this together. I hope yes. you found the information so far helpful. I'm going to keep going. Go for it. So the next thing we're going to do is look at a couple of resources that will help, help provide answers when you're looking things up on your own. Let's see here. So first of all, there's a University of California IPM website um, that we're going to show you right now. And that is, I wonder, I may have to turn off my laser pointer for this to work. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. Didn't want to do that. Oops. Go back up. So, oh, the laser pointer is back on. I don't think that I can initiate this with the pointer on. Okay. Well, let's see. Okay, we're going to go out here, we're going to go out there, turn it off. Now we're coming up here, let's see. There we go. Okay. Let's 
So this worked this morning. Oh, there we go. So can you see this new page? Yes, it's just very small. Can you uh, click to full screen? There we go. That's better. Yep, that's perfect. Thanks, Monica. Okay, so this is the integrated pest management website for the University of California Department of Agriculture and Natural Resources. And we're going to go to that portion of the site that has garden issues in it. This is a wonderful site. The link for this will be in your handout. And so here what we can see um, at the IPM site is a list of possible issues for homes, structures, people, pests and gardens and landscapes. We're going to go ahead and click on vegetables. And because we've been talking about tomatoes and a lot of us have tomatoes, we'll click on tomatoes and we'll click on blossom end rot. And so what I wanted to show you here is just that you can fairly easily get to lots of descriptions. Here's a description of the problem and some possible solutions and also some pictures so you know what the problem looks like. You'll see it on tomatoes and also on zucchini. So I just wanted to make sure that you knew about this particular um, website. And now I want to go back to our slides. The other uh, resource that I want to make sure to comment on is the Contra Costa County Library System. They have many books, ebooks, and films that are available now even during COVID. Another resource that I've mentioned a couple of times this evening is the Cornell University Vegetable Varieties for Gardeners. So this link will be in your handout. You don't need to write it down right now. You'll be receiving this. And remember, we talked about um, the resource that's on the plant label. The plant label will have these disease resistant codes on it if it's a hybrid. And this is a short list of them. There are quite a few and growers sometimes develop them as I mentioned before. But this, is, this can be very useful if you're looking to plant disease resistant varieties. Also, um, this is the gateway for all sorts of gardening information in Contra Costa County. This is the UC Master Gardener of Contra Costa County Gateway. It lists um, upcoming events and webinars, all kinds of helpful gardening information, and also our, our help desk uh, hours and contact information, which is currently only open by email. Um, you can send your own gardening questions to the help desk year round. It's staffed by volunteers who work Monday through Thursday mornings. And right now they're working remotely, so they're not answering the phone and you can't bring your um, sample bugs or plant material into the desk. But after COVID, you can bring samples in and we'll look at them with you there so that we can try to answer your questions while you bring us your items. So if you give us an email, please include your name, phone number, and city, a description of the problem, and photos of the problem if it's possible. The contact information for the help desk will be in the chat space and also in the handout. You can also follow us on social media. And I've come to the end of my presentation. I hope that you found it helpful, and I know that it certainly has been a pleasure for me to prepare and give it. And at this point, I'd like to turn back to Andrea for more information as well as questions. And we are so very thankful to the Contra Costa County Library for hosting and co-marketing this event. Specifically, librarians Allison Peters and Chris Gray, who invited and worked with each of us, with us each week over the past month and coordinated with many of their internal colleagues to bring this web-based program to life. And additionally, we thank the other Master Gardeners who helped make this possible through the creation of the presentation and handout content the PowerPoint visuals, and thought leadership implementation and marketing.
Um, I know we've reached, um, we're a few minutes beyond our maximum time because we start a little late with some technical questions. So I just want to cover one thing before we get into our questions. We will stay on a little bit later. We have quite a few questions. We'll stay on to answer some of those questions. Um, and if your question specifically doesn't get um, a answered tonight, please do feel free to use some of the tools Monica showed you or contact our help desk. So I just want to let you know that um, all of you will be receiving in 90 days a follow-up survey from our UC statewide offices. This is voluntary and it's pretty brief and short, um, but we would love if you um, would have a few minutes to fill it out. It's really the purpose of it is so that we can find different ways to get feedback, to better serve our communities. That's all of you. And how do we improve our programs and the value that you see in our programs for our events. So keep a lookout for that and access that if you have time, we sure would appreciate it. And um, wanted to mention really quick too, we do have a couple, uh, two more webinars coming up. We had a couple questions, which we were probably not going to get to tonight on good bugs, bad bugs. We have a talk on that on September 21st. And then right before that on the 31st, we'll be having a talk on Mediterranean climate and plants. So keep a lookout for that. And um, as Allison said, we'll be sending you an email um, this week with the link to this recording in YouTube and also a handout with a lot of the great information um, that Monica shared today that'll help you guys um, get started. So let's go back to our question side and we'll get through some of these questions. Somebody asked the question, um, if I am to buy like seeds, go to, to buy seeds to start seeds at my home, um, um, is it listed on the seed packet if the um, seed and that particular variety is disease resistant? Yes. Um, thank you for that question. That's a really great question. Um, yes, the seed packets will give the same information that the plant label would. Actually, seed packets have lots of great information, but it includes whether the plant is disease has been bred to be disease resistant, which means it would be a hybrid, um, and it will list the diseases that it's resistant to, and it will also list if it's uh, an heirloom, a seed for an heirloom, if it's, uh, it's naturally resistant to some of those diseases. So yes, that information should be on the seed packet. Great, thank you. And uh, kind of piggybacking on the idea of seeds, Terry, I'm gonna throw this next question of you. There are a couple questions about seeds and seedlings. Um, one, the first one is um, people, both of them are linked to having trouble growing them. Um, one uh, participant asked, they tried growing melons uh, via seedlings, watered daily, but they shriveled up and died. Another person said they planted um, some lettuce seeds and um, watered it regularly, but they didn't grow. So any tips for pe pe folks um, to get those seedlings and seeds off to a good start? So I think we're there. Oh, she's muted. Is Terry muted? Terry, are you muted? Might okay. Oh, you, I, got I, you. I, I couldn't unmute yet. myself, but I uh, somebody just sent me a link to unmute. Um, Perfect. So it's hard to know. The, there, there are a lot of reasons why the uh, seeds might not have come up. One is that uh, seeds are only viable for a limited amount of time. Uh, you might just do a Google search and see how long that is. Uh, you can usually find charts. So some seeds will last for many, many years, but carrot seeds, for example, particularly if they're pelleted, uh, carrot seeds are only gonna last one year. The other possibility are some of the things that um, Monica had talked about. It may be that you actually had a damping off problem caused by fungi, uh, so that even before they broke through the, um, uh, the surface of the soil, they may have been dying off that then. You might try next time, particularly for the uh, lettuces or, uh, yeah, the lettuces in particular, uh, to start them uh, inside the house. Uh, get them started there, let them grow to small seedlings, then harden them up by just taking them out for a couple hours a day and then lengthening that for about a week's time until they can tolerate the sunlight and the wind and then planting them. Great. Thank you, Terry. 
Okay, Sarah, I have a question for you. Um, a couple people have written in um, the chat room about yellow leaves, saying my squash, my green beans, the leaves are turning yellow and sometimes getting brown and brittle and dry. Can you give some folks some ideas of some things that might be causing that and possible solutions? Okay, that's a tough one. There's a, a number of reasons for leaves to turn yellow. Um, it can be lack of water, but it can also be lack of nutrients. Um, some plants, the older leaves will just often turn yellow and die when they, they reach just the end of their lifespan. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a tough one to have a specific answer to. Um, I am going to hand that off to anyone else that wants to add something. If there is anybody who wants to add something to that. I think you did a good job, Sarah. The, um, it might help us if we could, on the help desk, get a photo of, uh, of your leaves to be able to see the pattern of the yellowing because you can tell a lot from that. Uh, so, uh, and, but I agree, it might just be that we're late in the summer and uh, the leaves tend to die back, particularly any that are really shaded. If they're not uh, getting enough sunlight, sometimes those leaves will just die because they can't uh, contribute to photosynthesis if they're not getting sunlight. Great, thank you both. Uh, Monica, I've got some questions for you about, um, um, we talked a little bit about, the question was about uh, rotating plants. Um, somebody also asked in the question to say, in addition to rotating, are there things that they could do to amend their soil? Um, and if they do, how much of it do they need to replace? So amending soil with compost is always a great idea but it's not the same thing as replacing soil. Um, so replacing soil is something you might do in a container. It's somewhat impractical to do that in a vegetable bed. Um, so what I would say is that you wanna, you'll wanna amend the soil with um, good, good organic compost um, every year and that will help develop the, the uh, soil food web. Then you'll end up with uh, lots of living microbes, living things in your soil that will help uh, take care of and outcompete the things in your soil that you don't want, as I said at the very beginning. Um, and in terms of replacing soil, I, would, I don't know that I would recommend that unless you're talking about a vegetable bed, a raised bed, a small raised bed, or a container. Then, I would go about and go ahead and do that, yes. Okay, great. Thank you, Monica. Um, let's see, we'll rotate over to, I think, Sarah. Um, the question was about water. Is it okay to water veggies at night or is there a, a preferred time of the day that's recommended to water your vegetables? Okay, that is another good question. Um, I believe Monica did mention that the best time to water is in the morning, but some people aren't home in the morning. So, you know, um, it's difficult for some people to water first thing in the morning. So if you are going to water at night, be sure that the water isn't getting on the leaves. Remember about the fungal diseases and the, how they're spread through water splashing on the leaves. And also the fact that if you water them in the evening or at night, they'll stay wet a lot longer than if you water them in the morning. So the question is, yes, you can water them at night, but you have to be a lot more careful. Um, you're still gonna moisten the soil, but the, uh, there'll be less evaporation, but just be very careful to keep the leaves dry. Great, thank you. Monica, someone is hoping you could mention again um, what the natural predators are for, um, for a whitefly. 
Lace wings is one. That's the one I remember. Minute pirate bugs, maybe. Somebody else might know. Does Terry, do you know? I would guess that they probably uh, are a variety. The, the little tiny wasps uh, are often a predator of all those kind of uh, obnoxious insects. Okay, great, thank you. A couple questions about containers and um, uh, planting in a container. How high or tall should um, containers or raised beds be? Or it, is there a preferred height or thickness to them? Maybe I can take that one. I do sure. presentations on uh, container gardening. If you're in a uh, raised bed, uh, you are uh, uh, presumably have access to your native soils that are under the raised bed. Uh, so the height of the bed itself is more a matter of convenience than anything else. In my backyard, I've got uh, raised beds um, that are behind retaining walls that are uh, like two and a half feet uh, in height, which allows me to do stand-up gardening, uh, even though they're raised beds. For containers, it all depends on what it is you're growing. If you're growing lettuces, a container that's six inches deep will be uh, sufficient. But if you're doing a tomato, you probably are gonna want 16 to 18 inches of soil depth. Great, thank you. That covers most of the topics that were um, sent in the chat room related to this. We're about almost getting close to 20 minutes over. So I am gonna um, end this portion of our evening and just thank Monica very much, Terry and Sarah for being here to answer questions and again, the library. And again, the library will be sending out, we'll send out an email with the recorded version of this and the handout and our help desk is here to answer any questions you have this summer, winter, year round um, with your vegetable or home landscaping questions. So thank you again, everyone. And we hope to see you again at one of our future talks.